Thank you, Pekka, and thank you, Anastasia and, and Stefano, for the kind invitation. This has been a great, great event. I, there's a so kind of the, the, as you can see from the title, I come perhaps from a little bit different, uh, different uh, side of the of these theories, but this has been very enjoyable to hear all the all the all the talk so far. Okay, um, as I said, okay, I I didn't try to push for the most strange title or the most uh, uh, crazy title, but the other title I had in mind was uh, quasi-regular mappings and and uh, and kind of recovered dreams, and I don't think that describes anything at, at, at all. So, so I so I went to that. Okay, why recover dreams? It is a great to have a good graduate students who can solve problems for you. So that, that's the that's the uh, source for the other title. So Susanna is now in now in Helsinki, and, and uh, we have been working on this together. Okay, so I was thinking so that before I get to the title, I have a couple of slides before. So 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 that somehow if you you can think the problem like this. So that there's a holiday coming and you have uh, bought as a present this type of exercising machines where you have two handles and then for some reason you have no scissors but you have an infinite sheet of paper and you try to wrap your, your, your gift into this paper and then you soon realize that you run into trouble because your paper is not flexible enough and you cannot do the wrapping. This is my point of view how I do this. So that the, what we are going to try to do is that we are trying to find, trying to find mappings from a kind of standard space, uh, which is Rn, and we are trying to find the mappings to manifold, and we are not trying to cover, and you can think that we are trying to cover the body of the surface. The manifold we are trying to, where, where, where we are mapping, we are mapping to the boundary. And uh, okay, so that, but this is actually a very classical thing. So if you look the compass analysis, you look what is going on there, so that, okay, what kind of distortion I'm, I'm allowing? I'm, I'm allowing change of scale, scale, but I'm not allowing much of change of angle. And if you are looking the classical complex analysis, you are looking holomorphic maps, and you are looking holomorphic maps to Riemann surfaces, then there is this uh, classical result coming from uni uni uniformization, saying that the targets cannot be too complicated. So that if you are mapping from, from entire plane, to Riemann surface, then there, uh, and uh, you have a closed Riemann surface, then the Riemann surface better be a, a standard sphere or a torus. And um, so that now you see that here, what really is the key? The really is the key is that you have an entire map. You are mapping the whole complex plane because if you are uh, having a ball or a disk, you have a, a ball, uh, let's say in, 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 in Rn, you make it as small as you like, and then you take that uh, exponential mapping on the, the Riemann and manifold, and then you just place it there with the one plus epsilon by Lipschitz map. So that there is no tension if the, if the, if the domain is small. But with the entire, the, here the key is that Rn is actually asymptotically, or R2 or R, Rn, they are asymptotically very small. So if you try to map them, you will see a lot of stretching, which you have to somehow handle. The funny thing here is that there is no distortion in the classical complex analysis result. It's, uh, it's a conformal map, but if, even if you allow distortion, it, do, it, do, it, do, it doesn't help you. So the, if you put a finite distortion, like what, uh, oh sorry, a bounded distortion like what, uh, what, uh, what Yanni did, no, no change in the number of possible targets. Okay, I drew some maps. Okay, so uh, after seeing Alexis's videos, I am now a little bit embarrassed, but I uh, but I uh, drew some maps, uh, so that the the kind of the uh, torus case. How do you get to the torus on the plane? Well, you slice your you have uh, your vertical lines, and then you have your horizontal lines, and then you wrap to the both coordinates, and you will see no this. You have a nice local isometry which maps to the torus. Uh, if you want to go to S two, you can of course you can go to with the uh, with the with a, uh, with a stereographic pro pro projection. But from the purpose of this talk, I like to take this map where I take the uh, kind of a check, uh, chessboard with, uh, with the black and, black and white tiles, and then I map the tiles to lower and upper hemisphere of the, of, of the S2. 
You can do this in a holomorphic way, or you can do it in a, uh, uh, so that it's a by Lipschitz in, a, in each of the square, and then you are in the second, second, second case. Okay. So this is the two-dimensional setting, and so that the class of mappings that I'm really interested in are, are quasi-regular maps, as, as, as Yanni already introduced. And in the two-dimensional case, the proofs are really uh, classical, but I wanted to kind of highlight them a little bit, because so that, uh, so that how do you go from no distortion, meaning complex analysis, to a little bit of distortion, meaning quasi-conformal analysis. So you do exactly what Yanni Yanni told you to do, so that you take a, uh, you take the Stoller factorization of your, of your mapping so that you decompose it into homeomorphism and, and, and a holo, holo, holomorph, holomorphic map, and then you are done. So that the number of targets, or possible targets in the two dimensions cannot change because you are essentially performing a quasi-conformal change of coordinates in the domain side and so that the targets are, are the same. But this is kind of the, the proof using uniformization. So that in order to prove the classical classical result, you need to you you typically you want to use uniformization of kind of Riemann surfaces, but you can actually do this in a, in a soft fashion, and the soft fashion is that you take a surface, you just think it not not as a perhaps as a Riemann surface, but a two-dimensional Riemannian manifold. You pass to the universal cover, and you look how fast the cover 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 grows. And if your, your fundamental group is very large, meaning that it grows fast, then also the, all the, universe, the volume of the universal cover grows fast. But that means that it has a bad isoparametric inequality, which allows you to prove a capacity estimate at the, at the, at the infinity, which is not compatible with your, with your, with your lifted map. So that this, is a, this is another way. So that this says that actually in two dimensions, these things somehow boil down to the fundamental group of the surface. And uh, when, you, when you know that you have a polynomially growing group, and then, then, you, then you use the kind of the, somehow the soft version of the classification of surfaces to get, get, get your answers. So that you don't formally need the uniformization to do this. Okay. What happens in the dimension three? Um, again, I'm sorry about the picture. Okay. So it is a funny thing that you actually get a sharp classification in a kind of dimension three. Also, so that this was done by Jormakka in '88, and uh, at that time he had to uh, he had to uh, assume the geometrization conjecture of of, of Thurston in order to get any kind of classification. But what did he really do? So that what he really proved is that if you are mapping your R3 into a closed manifold, and then you are looking the you are looking kind of how it goes around, and you lift the manifold to the uni universal cover, you look how the fast the universal cover grows, you have the same polynomial estimates for the growth of the group and the volume and the, the vo volume in the, uni in the universal cover and for the isoparametric inequality and so on, so on, so on. And this was final, uh, later this was uh, made sharper by Varopoulos, I think, in the early, early 90s. Okay, um, this, kind of, uh, this kind of estimate. But uh, this means that topologically, the manifold where you are mapping, it doesn't have so-called connected sums, and then the uh, pieces of the geom then you rule, then you go through the pieces in the, the, in the kind of geometry and conjecture, and then you see that, okay, those are your, your possible possibilities. As you see, it's kind of a mouthful that <laughs> you can actually do this, because, uh, because you cannot, somehow, I have no idea, you know, honestly, so that I haven't read the geometrization, I don't know the Perelman's proof, so, I take the polynomial growth as a fact of life, and then, then, the, then I, I, I see what is coming out. But the, why I wanted to add this here? The, for me, the interesting thing is that the mappings, when you do them, they look exactly the same as in the two-dimensional mappings that I showed. Because how do you get into S3? You can do the S3 in so that, okay, I draw here just a kind of a, kind of a, uh, sequence of, uh, of blocks, but what you can do, you do a three-dimensional checkboard, and then you map, you color the kind of, the black ones you color the lower hemispheres, and the white ones you map to the lower, the upper hemispheres. Now you cannot do it conformally, but you can do it by Lipschitzly in, in each piece, and when you make the contacts work, you, ha you have your mapping. But this mapping, which is kind of the, the Im Im immediate analog from the two-dimensional map, actually allows the, uh, it has a kind of a, a sibling, 
coming from the fact that you can actually, if you do the two-dimensional mapping in the, in the Lipschitz category, you can take a product with another coloring map where you map segments around the circle, or you, you take the standard covering map with the circle, and you have a nice quasi-regular map. This is actually this is actually a locally by Lipschitz map. Okay, outside the outside the the branching uh, branching locus and so on. So so this is actually a mapping of bounded length distortion, whereas so is so is this. And you can you don't have to stop with this one. You go, so that in the last one in this sequence is just the standard Riemannian covering from R three to the product of circles. So that actually what you have here in Jormacher's theorem. So that the, the, the proof is uh, amazingly hard, and but the examples which actually realize these these choices, they are really the same. We have only we have essentially only one map in in each dimension, and we are taking product of that map. Okay. So, but where is the so that what is the goal of this talk? The goal is of, of this talk is to understand the uh, is to understand the four dimensional case. Okay. Why four-dimensional? Uh, there's a reason. So that in two dimensions, we the, the classification comes from uniformization. In three dimensions, the classification comes from uh, uh, geometrization and, and Perelman. And in dimension four, there is a classification theorem for simply connected smooth uh, smooth manifolds coming from their uh, in the, so their intersection form. So that the Donaldson Friedman theorem. Okay, that's one of the reasons why why four. The other reason that this is kind of perhaps not somehow how the story somehow e evolved here. Um, dimension four is kind of interesting in the sense that you actually start to have manifolds where the fundamental group plays no role. So that in the, the dimensions two and three, so that the, 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 the most of the game is about understanding the fundamental group. And then when you go to dimension four, you have the sphere, but then you have S2 crosses two, and you have S2 crosses 2 connected some with itself, CP2, blah, blah, blah. So that you have play, you start to have manifolds where the fundamental group plays no role. You cannot use the universal cover argument. You cannot use uh, volume growth on isoperimetric in inequality. So the question is that, what can you do? And uh, somehow this is kind of funny. That the timeline here is kind of funny because uh, the interest to dimension 4, and these questions actually came from a question of Gromov, from uh, something like 1980, perhaps 81, where he asked whether there are simply connected manifolds which do not allow a quasi-regular mapping from Rn. So that if there are four, uh, and then you're kind of, uh, the four dimensions is kind of the first one where you can ask, so we're gonna ask, is there a four dimensional manifold so that you cannot wrap it into R4? Okay. But this means that so that when we are going here, so that then the idea of how we understand the shape of the manifold changes. Because so far, the, the shape are kind of that these questions when we have a closed manifold in the target, you can pick any Riemannian metric. If you have one quasi-regular map there, you change your Riemannian metric, it just changes to constants. So that the, if you are asking ex existence of a mapping with some constant, then the Riemannian metric has really no role. So in dimensions two and three, it's about the fundamental group game, and in, but in starting from dimension four, we have to have another way to describe the shape. And so that here comes in the kind of the homology theory, so that instead of homotopy, you start to look homology, and then the, the, the answer is that then somehow because you are looking mappings which have very little reg regularity, and uh, there is a, and Rn has really no topology, so because it's contractible, so that then the question starts that okay, what is kind of the right type of, what is the right type of way to describe the target, the kind of the uh, shape of the target side, how, it, uh, how complicated it, 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 it is. And the first theorem was by, uh, done by Wonk and Heinonen in 2001, when they showed that if you have a quasi-regular, non-concept quasi-regular mapping from Rn into a, into a closed manifold, then the so-called the Ramco homology of the target is bounded in each degree. Okay. Um, I was thinking that, okay, should I now start to talk about the Ramco homology? 
and the answer is that I am not going to start to talk about the RAM cohomology. The, the RAM cohomology is a cohomology theory which you, can, which, you, uh, which you get when you start to look closed forms, so the forms whose exterior derivative is zero against exact forms, those who are already D of somebody. And this measures the, so that, that measures that how many different types of closed forms you have against exact forms. But I was thinking that instead of giving the de definition, when I, in a, I think in the next slide, there will be a picture, and I will use that picture to explain the, the situation. Okay, but this is a, okay, this was a, okay, I was a kid when the term came out, I was in grad school, and for me this was an amazing thing because, because there is no, so that this uh, is based on completely different methods than what the other proofs are. How do you do this? You take the p-harmonic Hodge theory on the target side, so you take p-harmonic forms, you pull them back, you use equi equidistribution theory of quasi-regular maps, and then you, in the end, this boils down to a Cauchy poly estimate with a, uh, with a sub embedding theorem, which actually counts the number of different types of forms. So I am not going to, I, I, I just wanted to say that this was, a, this was kind of a uh, amazing, amazing theorem at the time, especially, because, because nobody had used those methods in these problems before. Um, so actually, Gromov's question was answered in almost 20 years later by Prives, when he showed that this existence bound, uh, that this, uh, this bound for the, this kind of coming from compactness, is actually going to be made very sharp. So that, in, if you remember in, the, in dimensions two and three, I had the torus always coming out of that, two torus, three torus, so on, and it's always the torus is always the maximum thing homologically, so that the target, in some sense, cannot be more complicated than torus. And, uh, but the, and in the previous, uh, previous proof, the revelation somehow, the, the, the very key point is that you can, you can state this, this whole thing that the, that the torus is a maximum. But what you, when you are looking torus, this, this cohomology, this is really the same as looking at the exterior ring of, uh, of, uh, of Rn, or the exterior algebra of Rn. And the limiting object here, which limits these mappings, is actually the exterior algebra. So that this means that when you are actually, what he could do is that uh, in, for each k, he took the basis of forms, he pulls them back. And uh, the forms he kind of a priori on the global level, in L2 sense, they, are, they can be made orthogonal. And what he does is that he pulls them back in such a way that he can find a point where the forms evaluated at that point form a, form a linearly independent system. But then you are restricted by this. Amazing proof. Okay. So what we did with Susanna is that, okay, this theorem is very nice, but it leaves a little bit to desire because it says that there's an upper bound how complicated the manifold can be. And then, okay, with this you answer the Gromov question. But it doesn't answer the question whether there are sm manifolds with small cohomology which cannot be reached. And now this comes because, now I, I know that this comes a little bit, uh, becomes a little bit abstract, because kind of for the, what, how do the four-dimensional or six-dimensional manifolds really look like and what we know, but bear with me for a second. Okay, so the theorem what we have with Susan is that when you have this mapping from Rn into the manifold, <laughs> so, so instead of having just the dimension bound, you can actually prove that the whole cohomology as a graded algebra embeds into the sub-algebra sub of the exterior ring of, 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 of Rn. And this has kind of, okay, so that, I think this is the slide where somehow I would like to spend most of my, my, my time, because, because the, the statement is kind of crazy. Uh, okay, okay, what does it do? Because, because, uh, because you, when you look at the statement, you will start to wonder that, okay, what does this really mean? Can, does this actually say you something or, or kind of thing? What is going on? Okay, so let's go back to one of the examples in kind of three dimensions. So, and this kind of, so, uh, uh, what I'm gonna do is that I'm gonna try to a little bit give a blueprint of uh, uh, the how, we, how, the, uh, how the proof goes. So that uh, on the target side, I have here S2 cross S1, so that I have two sphere times a circle. And if you are looking at this manifold, so that this manifold has, so that this, uh, this sphere, this two sphere, this gives you a kind of a ob ob object in a homology, a two-dimensional object. 
And you can say that, okay, you look the volume form on this, uh, on this sphere. And then if you take the S2 here and you pull back the volume form to the product, you have exactly the generator of the two cohomology of S2 cross S1. So that the, when I'm talking about abstract cohomology, in this, in, in this particular case, it's really the two form on the S sphere which is, which is living there. And that's why the DRAM is nice because now we have forms. And we have Sobolev maps and we have forms, so we, are, we almost know what to do. Okay, because, okay, we have the two form living in the product, and what you can, and if I had the map that I, what I had before, the two form on the product, it, it uh, lifts to the, uh, the, the R3 in such a way that you have these horizontal planes, which are checkboard, and the, two and the volume form now lives on this checkboard. It is a little bit bent. It's not exactly constant, but it's a little bit bent two form. But, it, but the mapping, is, uh, uh, mapping in the third direction is just ro rolling on top of this one, so that you just see this two form kind of slicing. The, the, you have the planes, and you have the two form lying on these planes, and you have essentially a kind of in this, in this vertical direction, you have a, you have a constant thing. And on the other hand, you have the one form, so that you have the volume, you have the a line element on, on a S1, which also gives you a one form in the product. And now when you pull that back, it gives you these lines which are going perpendicular to the planes. So that the, and now what is this theorem really saying? It is saying that whatever intersection pattern you see on the target side in the sense of cohomology, it must be able, you must be able to realize that intersection pattern in the exterior algebra of Rn. And in this particular case, it means that when you are looking at these squares, and you, if you are looking at a nice mapping, let's say in the middle here, you have, uh, you have differentials, you have the volume form, and you have the, you have the, you have the pullback of the theta here so that you have a dt. And you have the pairing which gives you the volume. So that, so that what is this? This is really, telling you is that, so that this is actually the, somehow the, 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 what, the, what the whole thing is, is so that you can, you have your target object which is described by cohomology, but you can use forms to understand it. And then when you look uh, pairs of forms and you intersect them, whatever kind of patterns you see there in, the, in a kind of uh, um, sense that you, you, take the, you take the wedge product of the forms and you, you, you integrate over thing, everything, that's your measure, that's your norm on the target side, you pull them back here, and you see that you have this perpendicularity or other type of intersection what you are wanting to see. And so that in this sense, this is actually, so that this is actually a kind of a geometric counterpart of this kind of standard topological result, saying that if you have a closed manifolds, you have a, of the same dimension, you have a non-zero degree map, then the cohomology pulls back injectively to the, to the domain side because of Poincare duality. And this actually means that in order to do these intersections and these kind of things, we need to do spore graduality, but we don't have it here in the RN side, and we have to do something else there. Okay. And this is kind of the how I, how I kind of see the theorem. Okay. Okay, but does, it, but, but does this give, give us anything? So that this is just, so what do you get? So that because you have this algebra thing going on, you can now just go fully to the algebra to just look what you, what you get. And okay, this was actually the starting point what, what we, I wanted to do, because now when you look this, you are, you are in dimension four, you look uh, two cohomology, and you look so-called intersection pairings. And, um, and then what you have is that you have, a kind of, you have your forms, you, you, you have to do two forms, you wedge them together to get the four form, you integrate over the whole manifold, you get positive, negative, zero, these type of things. And what is here is that you have the middle dimensional Betty number, which counts the number, which counts the positive or the negative, negative uh, subspaces of the of the of the intersection form. And you get here the improvement of half. But this is this is extremely nice, because when you have this result coming from the theorem, now you take the Donaldson-Friedman classification, and you just start to look all the possible closed, closed, closed simply connected four manifolds, what they are, and then you start to draw a table, and when you, have, when you go too far, you cross everything out, you cross everything out, and, and you have a kind of a block of, <laughs> you have a kind of three by three matrix where you have a couple of different types of, that, that types of manifolds, and the, 
Dalton Friedman classification says that if you have a quasi regular map into a simply closed integral into four manifold, then the manifold is one of these. And the key here is that so that the 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 uh, positive the Betty numbers are at most three in this case. Uh, you cannot really go high. Okay, no, I don't know really how to go higher because I kind of the, the, the I don't really have classification theorems, but the but this uh, fact prevails. The most interesting thing here is that there is a very recent paper of Pierre Galini and Chudas, where they show where they construct branched covering map PL branch covering mappings from a tori from a, from from the four torus to simply connect the four manifolds. And he, they know how to construct mappings exactly with these manifolds. And what you get is that those mappings are actually quasi regular. So that what you have is that there is a limitation coming from the theorem. And together with Donaldson Friedman, it gives you a list. And Pierre Galilei too does know how to actually kind of realize the whole list. So that this gives the, this gives the, the, the full classification in, in this case. I must say, I was very surprised because. The uh, method of Pergolini and Tsudas, I, I, I just didn't know any, anything about it uh, before before uh, trying to read the papers. They are using they are using methods coming from homo homotopy theory and extending over cells of different uh, dimensions and, and these type of things. And um, the because before that paper, I knew only two interesting examples of manifolds which uh, which received mapping, ma ma mappings like this. They were S2 cross S2 connected some S2 cross S2, which was constructed by constructed by Rickman, I think, in 2004. And then the CP2, which was done by Prives and Lewis, though, I think 2019, something like that. And uh, these are the, this, this then the, the Pierre Galini Chudas method, which is kind of somehow completely soft in some sense, gives you the, gives you the full list. Okay. Seven minutes, how nice. Okay, uh, what are the ideas? So, I think I actually need a little bit the board. So, what's the idea? You have your Rn here, and then you have your manifold, which I now draw as a torus because I don't know any other manifolds I can draw. Okay. So this is my target manifold, and this is my mapping. So <coughs> the, the fact that the manifold, so that if you make that the manifold has any middle dimensional cohomology, then it drives this, cra this mapping crazy so that it has to have a, that the integral of the Jacobian is infinite over the whole RN. Meaning that the larger balls you take, then, the th then in the sense of the integral of the Jacobian, your mapping covers more and more and more. Actually, in the sense of Picard theorems, it really covers more and more and more, but we don't need that. So what do we do? We localize, we take a ball, and then we start to take a sequence of balls. So that this is my mapping Fi. We take a sequence of balls where we capture more and more of the Jacobian of the map. Actually, I, we, I, I could just take the origin and take the larger and larger balls. No, no problem there. If you, so that this is saying that, okay, so that those who, who have worked with quasi-regular mappings, okay, now you know that this mapping is now equidistributing. This sequence of, uh, sequence of mapping is now equi equidistributing over the target. But, okay. So what's the strategy? We use standard Hodge theory. Every, every cohomology class is, contains a unique harmonic form, okay? The key observation is that, okay, if you take the, the, the RAM cohomology, it's an, it's an algebra. So that you take cohomology classes, you take wedges, you get cohomology classes and things like that. But if you try to pass it to the harmonic forms, this is not true, so in general. And so for manifolds which have this property that you, you, get, the, uh, uh, you get the algebra of harmonic forms are, 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 are got formal manifolds. Okay, but not every manifold is formal. Okay, what do we do? We use this fact that we are covering more and more and more, and we define a kind of a kind of a taint down pullback operator, a normalized pull, pull, pullback operator, where we take the amount we cover and we put it to the right power, and we when we pull back the forms, they are now kind of uniformly bound. Okay, the target here is um, okay. Actually, I should have. Right, but then this is slightly different because they don't 
at this, sorry, at this point they don't map to J-algebra, now I, now I can't understand. Okay, uh, but instead of, okay, I should write here the, a kind of a, a kind of a direct sum of Sobel spaces, but let's just forget here that, that this is not yet in the algebra. But then when you pass to the limit, this is the point, so that because your mappings cover more and more and more, and you don't have the algebra on the target side, when you pull it back, it rectifies so that you actually pull back, so that the limiting map after the limit of these pullbacks actually normalize to an algebra homomorphism. So what you do is that you formal, the mapping actually formalizes the formalizes the, 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 the non-algebra of the, of the harmonic forms. And then when you have that, you have a, you have a situation that you have here a Sobolus space, uh, but then what you do is that you evaluate a suitable point to get the, to, 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 to get the result. Okay, so that there are actually, so that there, is a, there are kind of two key ingredients. Okay, this is the Sobolus algebra. Uh, so what is uh, the kind of the, uh, the, the in the middle dimensions you are taking the sub, you are taking differential forms whose exterior derivative is in is in n over k, uh, but you are not really interested in all the all the derivatives. In the top dimension, I could write here w one n uh, uh, the w one one, but actually kind of writing l one is somehow more more appropriate because the exterior derivative differentiate anybody, everybody anyway because, because things are killed after, after the dimension. And then the, key, the last one is that you have constant functions here. Because constant functions pull, pull back very nicely under any map. That's, the, that's, the, that's, that, 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 that's why you use the problem here. Okay, so what is, the, what is kind of the key element? You get this mapping by taking, you, you, you take these harmonic rep representatives, you pull them back, and you show a weak convergence to an, to an operator uh, in a kind of a weak, in kind of weak ln over k norm. And then you show that uh, when you have when you are here in the b below the top dimension, you have this wedge, wedge, pro wedge products going on. And how does this really work? The reason is that because you are equidistributing all the target manifold, if you have a closed form, it dies in these it dies in these uh, weak convergences. So what it actually happens? You don't actually need the harmonic forms at all. You just need to pick some representatives in those cohomology classes, and then you can actually run run the same proof. And how do you get the how do you get the, this one holding? Because you see that the, there's a kind of a double limit, dou double weak limit. The idea is that the operator you are looking actually arises in such a way that you look your pullback operators. You take the Ivanovich Lutoborsky uh, Poincaré operator, which which uh, integrates the operators one level up. There you have a strong convergence to an operator, and then you take the D of that, and you you, you have your operator. So that this is kind of a compensated compactness thing, I think. Okay, but the, but where is so that? But in some sense, this could be totally void, so that we are converging always to zero. But the, somehow, the crucial part is actually this: so that when you take the volume form on the target, you do this pullback sequence, you actually converge to a measure, which is a prob probability measure, which is absolutely continuous with respect to the with respect to the, to the Lebesgue measure. And this is actually where I want to pause a little bit. This type of sequence of mappings where you have more and more Jacobian in your maps, there is no pointwise convergence of the maps. There is no local uniform convergence, nothing like that. So, but what we, but on the level of, on the level of measures, when you normalize the Jacobians, you observe that there is no concentration of the measures, so that these mappings really kind of that, the, you, you cover the, I, the mappings in your sequence cover more and more and more, but actually they cover everything evenly. There is no concentration in the, at the limit. And this means that when you have this, then you use this fact to show that, okay, um, okay, okay, how do you get this? You get this fact by actually applying this result in the lower dimensions. So that you have the fact that the, your volume form splits, and when you pull them back, you have two Ds in the splitting, and you can actually use that in your favor. This is something that kind of appeared already in a, in a totally different form in the original proof of Bonkenheinen. Okay, and uh, this is how you get this. You get the convergence and you get the non-trivial measure, and then when you have that, then you take this operator which is defined in the lower levels, you extend it to the full algebra, 
and then you take the point wise, you, you go the point wise linear. So that the, the curious, the funny thing here is that, so that the, the result, despite that the, there is all this topology and manifolds, the result is really about the weak convergence of measurement. Okay, I think I end with, end with that. Thank you.